My name's Jean Gillers. I'm a rheumatologist in the Division of Rheumatology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. And this is a pre-workshop video podcast uh, for the Canadian Rheumatology Association annual meeting in Quebec City in February 2015, and it's a workshop on physical examination. So the topic of this pre-workshop video podcast is the Syriax method of musculoskeletal examination by selective tissue tension. I have no disclosures. So the objective of this video podcast is to give some understanding of the concept of Syriac's method of musculoskeletal examination by its selective tissue tension, which involves active range of motion, passive range of motion, and isometric muscle testing. And secondly, is to understand how the concepts of a capsular or non-capsular restriction of range of motion and end feel contribute to the accuracy and diagnosis of regional pain disorders by physical examination. So there are three concepts that are needed to make a diagnosis using the selective tissue tension method. The first concept is that of active range of motion, passive range of motion, and isometric muscle testing. The next is end feel, and the third is capsular or non-capsular pattern. Once this in information has been documented, both the positive and the negative findings, the provisional diagnosis can be formulated. This process can be illustrated by studying six common causes of shoulder pain. So let's take six common problems causing shoulder pain to illustrate the process. So the six uh, common causes I have selected, uh, first of all, frozen shoulder, rotator cuff tendonitis, bicipital tendonitis, acromioclavicular joint arthropathy or enthesitis, acute subacromial bursitis, and chronic subacromial bursitis. So these six common causes of shoulder pain are up on the right-hand side of the slide. And to diagnose a frozen shoulder in uh, the group of where passive range of motion is abnormal, that's where we see a frozen shoulder. And the important thing about the passive range of motion being abnormal in this particular first group is that the isometric muscle testing is normal. When it comes to isometric muscle testing being abnormal, we can diagnose a rotator cuff tendonitis and a bicipital tendonitis. But again, here, this is with normal passive range of motion testing. And the third group is where both the passive range of motion is abnormal and the isometric testing is normal, abnormal as well. So here we can, the boxes that of the six uh, common shoulder pain problems, uh, chronic subacromial bursitis, acute subacromial bursitis, and the AC joint arthropathy enthesitis. That's where they fit in. So now when it comes to the first box where passive range of motion only is abnormal with normal muscle isometric testing, we have to divide the passive range of motion being abnormal into one of two patterns, either the capsular pattern or the non-capsular pattern. And which does the frozen shoulder fit into? A frozen shoulder will have a capsular restriction of motion of the, uh, on testing. Now, when it comes to isometric muscle testing being abnormal, as we see with the rotated cuff tendonitis and bicipital tendonitis, there are three groups. The pain on testing the muscle strength isometrically. There can be pain and no weakness. There can be weakness and no pain. And there can be pain and weakness. And we use this system, when we use this system, the isometric testing being abnormal with pain and no weakness, this is where both the rotator cuff and the tendonitis and the bicipital tendonitis, that's the group that they fit into. Now when it comes to the, the situation where both the passive range of motion is abnormal and the isometric muscle testing is abnormal, again, we have to divide up the passive range being abnormal into either a capsular or non-capsular pattern. And when it comes to the isometric testing, we have to divide up into the three groups there, pain and no weakness, weakness and no pain, and pain and weakness. Now, what if it's a chronic subacromial bursitis? In terms of the passive range of motion, this will be a non-capsular restriction of motion. And when it comes to the isometric testing, there'll be pain but no weakness. Now, when it comes to the AC joint arthropathy or enthesitis, what type of capsular or non-capsular pattern will be the decreased range of motion? 
Again, this will be a non-capsular restriction of motion. And in terms of the isometric muscle testing, there'll be pain and no weakness. And when it comes to acute subacromial bursitis, will this be a capsular or non-capsular pattern? Again, this will be a non-capsular restriction of motion. And in terms of the isometric muscle testing, which will it be? It will be pain and weakness. So now if we go back to the isometric muscle testing being abnormal, the two examples that we had for the shoulder uh, conditions were rotator cuff tendonitis and bicipital tendonitis. Now, there was both pain and no weakness on testing these muscles. So how do we distinguish between rotator cuff tendonitis and bicipital tendonitis? Well, the rotator cuff is, of course, made up of supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor. And each of these muscles have, has a different function. So because supraspinatus is an abductor, isometric testing of abduction will reproduce pain. Infraspinatus is an external rotator, and that will reproduce pain if on isometric resisted external rotation. Internal rotation, if that's painful, subscapularis is uh, implicated. And teres minor, which is a very unusual uh, tendonitis to get with a rotator cuff, there's pain on resisted internal rotation and abduction. So that it's important to document all of the uh, muscle groups um, around. Not If you suspect it's supraspinatus tendonitis, don't just test abduction. Test all of the muscles around the shoulder so that you can determine only a single muscle action is painful and you can diagnose a supraspinatus tendonitis. When it comes to bicipital tendonitis, there are two maneuvers that reproduce the pain. Resisted long lever flexion and resisted horizontal adduction, adduction. So, there are, so those are different muscles that are being tested to the muscles of the rotator cuff. So the specific isolated ab abnormality of the, or the pain produced by the isometric testing can determine which uh, muscle or tendon is involved. So formulating the physical examination data, we've shown how six common causes of shoulder pain can be distinguished on physical examination by ex organizing the data into one of three groups. Group one, passive range of motion abnormal only. Group two, isometric muscle testing being abnormal. And group three, both the passive range of motion is abnormal and the isometric muscle testing is abnormal. So now we have to organize the differential diagnosis. So let's take the shoulder pain again to illustrate the process. So when we look at our six categories of shoulder pain down on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, frozen shoulder at the top, the frozen shoulder was a capsular restriction of motion and, uh, with decreased passive range of motion. So what else can give you a passive range of motion uh, in a capsular pattern? Well, all the inflammatory arthritis syndromes can do this, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, spondyloarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, gout, septic arthritis. Um, all of these can give you a capsular pattern. In addition, osteoarthritis of the glenohumeral joint or a frozen shoulder will give you a capsular pattern. So where, how do you get a, a, a passive range of motion being abnormal in a non-capsular pattern with normal isometric muscle testing? This is in the group where we see ligamentous laxity. Perhaps the person has previously dislocated the shoulder and has a laxity in one direction, uh, or one or two directions, or the patient might have a hypermobility syndrome. Now, when we come to isometric muscle testing, uh, we've got three categories here, pain and no weakness, weakness and no pain, and pain and weakness. So if the pa patient has pain and no weakness, this is where there, it implicates a tendonitis, a bursitis, or a hematoma in the muscle. If there's weakness and no pain, then this implies a tendon rupture, so, or abnormal nerve conduction, such as proximal muscle weakness. So there'll be weakness, no pain. And the last category there is pain and weakness on isometric testing, and that's more ominous. So now when we look to the third group, the passive range of motion being abnormal, the isometric testing also being abnormal, we must once again uh, separate uh, the findings into capsular or non-capsular pattern and the isometric testing into pain and no weakness, weakness and no pain, or pain and weakness. So what can give you a capsular pattern, weakness and no pain? 
Well, the inflammatory arthritis syndromes, if there's a global weakness of grade four for a long-standing inflammatory arthritis around the shoulder, that will give you a capsular range of motion, uh, weakness but no pain. So what can give you a capsular pattern with pain and weakness? Well, acute gout or acute septic joint. Any isometric testing on the joint will reproduce pain. So what can give you a non-capsular pattern? Pain, but no weakness. This is where we see the chronic bursitis, uh, where, or the chromioclavicular joint arthropathy or anthocytis, and a labral tear. They'll give you a non-capsular restriction of motion of the joint, and there'll be pain, but no weakness. And now what about pain uh, and weakness, along with a non-capsular pattern? Acute bursitis will do this. But what's ominous here is you have to think of the fractural metastasis. That will give you uh, a non-capsular restriction of motion and pain and weakness. So that's always a combination where you really uh, need to look further. So when we put all those together, the shoulder pain differential diagnosis, you can see that by separating out into three groups, passive range, isometric muscle testing, and the two together being abnormal, you can sort out uh, the diagnostic categories. So the concept one, this is really essential. Syriax uh, organized the information into active, passive, active range of motion, passive range of motion, and isometric muscle testing. The active range of motion just tells you how willing the patient is to move the limb or trunk. The passive range of motion tests what we call the inert structures, and the isometric resisted muscle testing tests the so-called contractile structures. So using this method, using the active range of motion, this really does not help the diagnosis. The passive range of motion testing the inert structures, that means that the structures getting stretched or uh, uh, moved, uh, the capsule, the ligaments, fascia, cartilage, dura mater, dural sheaths, and the nerve roots, and maybe the bursa, depending on the position of the bursa. And with isometric resisted testing, the testing the contractile structures, clearly the muscle contracts, but we regard the tendon as a contractile structure because when the muscle contracts, there's tension put on the tender, tendon. And there may, ne may not be a bursa involved. If there's a bursa under the muscle or tendon and the muscle is contracted, that can reproduce pain. So bursas can be regarded either as an inert structure or as a contractile structure. Concept two, the capsular pattern and the non-capsular pattern. The capsular pattern, is a limited range of motion in a fixed proportion, and it's specific to each joint. Non-capsular pattern is any other pattern. And this is a very difficult concept to grasp. So, when there's a capsular restriction of motion, all of the uh, inflammatory arthritis syndromes are, give you a capsular restriction of motion. Rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, the crystal arthro arthropathies, traumatic arthritis, um, heme arthritis, septic arthritis, and also a frozen shoulder will give you a capsular pattern. A non-capsular pattern of decreased range of motion, we see this with ligament sprains. When it comes to the tendons, we'll see it with tendonitis or tenosynovitis. If there's internal derangement in the joint, such as with a, a disc uh, protrusion or a meniscal tear or labral tear, we'll, see, we'll get a non-capsular restriction of motion. If there's extra articular limitation, such as with bursitis or a hematoma, there'll be a non-capsular restriction of motion. And in terms of problems with the bone, if there's a fracture, bone metastasis, or avascular necrosis, there'll be a non-capsular restriction of motion. So when it comes to the upper limb examples, a decreased range of motion in the glenohumeral joint, you lose, first of all, uh, external rotation. And as uh, that will be the, the largest um, decrease in range of motion, then glenohumeral abduction, and then internal rotation. When it comes to the elbow joint, there'll be no more loss of flexion than extension. And the wrist joint, you lose the same degree of flexion as extension. So why is every joint kind of unique in their pattern of, uh, in the capsular pattern? Well, the capsule in the mid, the capsule in the zero um, position that we, in the anatomical position, is not taught equally in all directions. And that's because the uh, way we measure the joint range of motion is by the so-called uh, neutral zero method. 
And that's where we all have to agree on the zero position, starting position for each joint being measured. And this was first described in 1936, and it used the anatomical um, position as the starting position. So um, before um, 1936, the uh, people describing the range of motion at the knee joint could either say the range was 0 to 135, or they could say it was 180 to 45, or 195 to 45. And if they were describing a flexion deformity at the knee, they could say it was uh, the, f the range of hyperextension was 0 to 15, or 180 to 195, or 195 to 45, or uh, minus 15. So it was very confusing. So the, uh, the neutral zero method was adopted widely in, in, this, in the 1970s. So that means that when we take the knee joint, for example, the capsule is not taught equally in all directions when the knee is at zero degrees. Uh, and so when there's fluid in the joint, when you put more and more fluid in the joint, the capsule becomes distended. There's more room in the, in the popliteal fossa, the posterior part of the joint, and that's where the fluid fills up. And so say, uh, for example, uh, the range of motion is, if you put 100 cc's of fluid in to, into the knee joint, the range of motion will be, a flexion will be 15 to 70. It'll be a capsular range of motion. If there is only a little bit of fluid put in the knee, the range of motion will be 0 to 120. You'll lose no extension, but you'll lose a slight amount of, of flexion. So in a non-capsular restriction of motion at the knee joint, for example, if you have pre-patellar bursitis, then you could find that extension is not um, limited in any way uh, because you're not stretching the bursa, but flexion will be limited, and so the range of flexion could be 0 to 40. Third concept, end feel. So end feel. So this is uh, what, what limits the end of normal range of motion is physiological end feel. So uh, elbow flexion is limited by soft tissue on soft tissue, elbow extension by bone on bone. An abnormal end feel is a pathological end feel. So what are the different types? There's, Cyrex describes six types. Bone on bone, that's normal at elbow extension and knee extension. Soft tissue approximation, normal on elbow flexion and knee flexion. Capsular feel, normal on external rotation of the shoulder and hip internal rotation. A springy block. That's always abnormal. And we see that with hip labral tears and knee meniscal tears. You get to the end of flexion and the, the end range, you sort of feel a bounce. There's a springy end to it. A muscle spasm, end feel, that's always abnormal, and we see that with fractures. And then this very unusual sense that you have every now and again uh, is an empty feel, and it's always abnormal, and we associate that with met metastasis. So the end feel, it's very important where you put your hands. So on the top here, you can see uh, elbow flexion with soft tissue limiting the, the range. But when it comes to extension, the correct position is to have your hands either side of the elbow joint. If your hand is on, if your hand instead of being on the distal forearm is on the hand itself, you've lost the sense of end feel on that elbow extension. So in summary. There are three concepts for making a diagnosis using the musculoskeletal system of selective tissue tension as described by Syriacs. When you examine, you have to use an active range of motion, passive range of motion, and isometric muscle testing. At the end of range, when testing the passive range, it's important to determine the end feel. And if there is a decreased range of passive range of motion, you have to decide if the limitation is in a capsular or non-capsular pattern. And when we do that, we can uh, divide the, patient, the patient's finding in, into passive range of motion only being abnormal, isometric testing only being abnormal, or a combination of the two. And when we do that, we can divide up all of the, the differential diagnosis into these three groups. So you can see in the example, the six examples that we use for common shoulder pain disorders, that it was uh, easy to distinguish between these uh, six common causes of shoulder pain by using the selective tissue tension method of examination. Thank you very much.